Welcome back to this edition of Insights. I'm joined by ACC Professor of Political Science, Tim Kuhnlein. And Tim, you know, we we're just discussing what's going on with Trump's proposed budget and how it kind of affects people here in Michigan. But let's talk about more of the outline of what's going on there. Right. Well, what we're really seeing is a huge transfer of money from the domestic programs to um, military. That's essentially what's happening here. And it's breaking down um, into a wash for the most part. Uh, but it will have a real impact, obviously, on those uh, uh, domestic programs. You know, they're calling it a budget proposal, but a lot of people are saying it's actually a blueprint because he's not even showing the revenue side. So there's no real analysis of uh, inputs, outputs. It's more or less a wish list. Um, and we'll see how it plays out. I mean, obviously, he's pushing the envelope to, to um, get the greatest gain in the direction that he wants to see it go. Uh, and as I said, it's basically a transfer to military, um, but it doesn't really account for in terms of balancing the books for a trillion dollars of proposed additional spending um, on domestic uh, imp um, improvements and so forth. So um, we'll see how it uh, goes out. We've got to remember that Congress has the power of the purse string, starting with the House. And so like you said, there's going to be an additional $1 trillion in spending that this blueprint has accounted for. But really, when you know he's talking about cutting taxes, can't really be feasible. Well, and we've had that discussion in a previous um, program. Uh, you know, he believes that he'll be able to grow the economy and therefore generate new tax revenue with by at the same time decreasing the tax rates. And we've heard that sort of uh, trajectory for a long time. But here we are, uh, 19 trillion dollars later. Um, so you know, um, like I said, his so-called budget is really a blueprint uh, wish list. It does not address the revenue side of this at all yet. And so domestically speaking, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on besides the budget. Right now, there's a lot of talk about health care system and you know replacing the Affordable Care Act. So what's going on with that? Yeah, a lot of activity over this last week. And um, really what we're talking about here is um, trying, the, the Republicans in control of this process right now are trying to control the costs that would be um, borne by the federal government. Um, basically putting caps and limits, removing the taxes that were part of the original Affordable Care Act. You know, it's interesting that this legislation is actually titled the American Health Care Act. They removed the word afford affordable out of it, and you can kind of tell by the, the, the revisions of, or the reform um, component of this, that there's really no um, clear indicator that this will curb um, the costs of health insurance, which is really the problem here. Um, and, and so the affordable component is the big question. We put caps on how much the federal government will give to the states for Medicaid, um, and then furthermore, um, uh, for the, the sort of the middle class Americans that are out of the insurance um, market, unless they have, are mandated into the program or in the case of the Republican proposals, uh, incentivized, they basically are giving tax um, incentives to a certain amount uh, to allow uh, people to buy their own insurance. But of course, that begs the question, do these um, Americans have the, the financial resources to make up the difference? And then we've also lost that tax revenue um, for federal operations in general. So we're talking about the budget, health care, a ton of stuff going on domestically. Let's move into some of what's going on with these congressional investigations, because you know, there's been a lot of talk about that kind of behind the scenes of all this budget and health care. Yeah, um, a very heavy cloud over the whole political dynamic of our country, uh, especially with the Intelligence Committee of the House um, having hearings this past week. Uh, with the FBI uh, director um, basically saying that indeed there has been no um, indication of a wiretapping of Trump Tower, uh, essentially discrediting the president's claims about the former president, uh, but then further um, suggesting, well, actually um, uh, reinforcing the fact that the FBI is indeed investigating um, a collusion, and they have been since uh, the summer, well before the election. Um, so uh, what has complicated things most recently is um, the, the nature of the partisanship now within the, um, the, the Congressional Committee, um, particularly the House uh, Intelligence Committee, 
uh, with its chairman going to the White House uh, uh, later this week. Um, that is begging the question, is the House really the place for this investigation to continue? Should it be transferred into the Senate? John McCain is making indications that the Senate should be handling this. And what this is all leading to probably is that we'll have some sort of ind independent uh, special prosecutor, independent commission established. I think you put a great point. It's kind of like this dark cloud that's surrounding what's actually happening with, within the political world right now. And so what kind of implications does it have, you know, even having this happening in the background? Well, it's going to play out in the, um, the general uh, nature of our economy. We're already seeing indications from Wall Street that confidence is diminishing a little bit compared to the euphoria that we've seen with the stock market um, boom. But oil prices are dropping. Um, we're losing, the dollar is losing ground in international markets. You know, this is, there's a lot of anticipation of something. It's very highly speculative. But I think we're realizing the reality of the dynamic here and how difficult this road is going to be, especially with the clouds hanging over um, um, questions of legitimacy, um, whether they're legitimate claims or not. Um, but um, it's politics, right? And, and furthermore, um, you know, with the, the partisanship that we're seeing play out in a divided America, um, it, it, it's, there's, there's, there's hope, but um, we're clearly dealing with some difficult dynamics here. And so difficult dynamics kind of relate to what's going on with the Supreme Court nomination. Yeah, there was a lot of hope, I think, that um, we would get through this. I mean, uh, despite the antics of um, denying the, the appointment under the previous president, um, you know, we're in a situation now where we have a vacancy. And um, we thought we would pass this without filibustering. Um, all of this, of course, will remain to be seen. But um, clearly, all indications are at some point or another, um, the, um, the position will be filled. Um, and no doubt by Gorsuch, um, unless uh, the Democrats are going to play a really difficult and long game here. Um, you know, the question now is, should a president who's under this type of uh, scrutiny, the investigations, should we be making an appointment under his guise? Um, but, you know, the reality is, even if you hold this out for months or a year or whatever, um, the position's going to be filled um, by a, a, a Trump administration that um, will keep the court basically static in its politics. And so let's talk about some of the, the confirmation process. And you know we've heard about these like 20 hour marathon yeah. sessions within Senate. So what exactly is that? Um, politics, um, and in many respects, a lot of nothing. Um, because you know for the majority of history, um, these hearings didn't even take place. And most judges are placed uh, without these levels of scrutiny. Um, but obviously, this is the grand stage, and we're in a highly politicized period of time. You know, we started doing this with the advent of television, and um, and there's no question the scrutiny should exist. Uh, but um, what we're really looking at here, I think, in this particular case, is why wasn't the position filled under the previous administration? And that's kind of what it is. It's like, well, you didn't you didn't confirm our guy, so why should we do that to you? Right. So we're just in a partisan um, kind of. Um, superficial partisan debate, although it's substantive in terms of the, the mechanics of, of what the Constitution mandates. Um, but in terms of the legitimacy of the, can the, the, the nominee, I, I don't think there's really anything to dispute other than a philosophical concern about where he would take the court. But even as an equivalent of Scalia, or maybe more conservative, less conservative, whatever the case may be, it doesn't change the trajectory of the court itself. All right, well, we're going to continue this conversation, so stay tuned because there's more insights coming up after the break. <laughs> 